Welcome back to the Agentic Schools Manifesto. This is Chapter 3, The Science of Motivation. Educational leadership is a calling, not merely a job. Every calling has a moral component that prevents it from being relegated to the lowly status of a job we do in order to survive. The bureaucratic nature of mainstream schooling drives the status of all work in schools towards the lowly job end of the spectrum. The dominant paradigm applies that pressure in two different ways. It misleads us about what counts as an educative experience, academics above all else, and it devalues the roles that we are playing in the lives of students. That pressure will succeed in devaluing schoolwork as long as leaders fail to properly understand and articulate the moral stakes. As a leader, you must be clear about the moral imperative to which your work is a response. In education, we have a useful name for the mechanism that maintains the problematic paradigm, the hidden curriculum. Because of how brains interact with policies outside of our awareness, we do not have any choice about having a hidden curriculum. Later, I will describe how the hidden curriculum operates through the use of cultural mechanisms like the explicit policies that legislators famously fight about and implicit policies that can go entirely unnoticed. A classic example of brains being affected by policy, in the broad sense that I mean it, comes from the social psychology literature. Quote, Social psychologists have shown that when people care about appearing intelligent and are at risk of being stereotyped as unintelligent, they tend to react in very much that way. A significant and still growing body of evidence reveals that stereotype threat heightens a person's performance anxiety, and when the task or test is sufficiently challenging, the presence of stereotype threat causes the person to perform less well, thereby confirming the stereotype. In one of the seminal experiments revealing that tendency, black and white Stanford students took a challenging 30-minute verbal exam that should have been equally difficult for each group based on their common experiences and knowledge bases. However, the group's performance turned significantly upon how the test was framed. When the test was presented to these subjects as a test of ability, white students performed far better than black students. Yet, when the test was presented as a means of understanding how people solve certain sorts of problems and subjects were told the test was not a measure of a person's intellectual ability, the two groups performed almost identically. This study, and many like it, reveal how stereotypes exist in the atmosphere, and this influences us as part of the unseen situation. Unlike the nervous and tongue-tied date seeker struggling to find the right words and to adopt the proper demeanor, neither the anxiety created by stereotype threat nor its source is likely to register consciously on the part of the test taker. But stereotype threat does indeed create the performance harming anxiety. Sub quote, Black students taking the test under stereotype threat seem to be trying too hard rather than not hard enough. They reread the questions, reread the multiple choices, rechecked their answers more than when they were not under stereotype threat. The threat made them inefficient on a test that, like most standardized tests, is set up so that thinking long often means thinking wrong, especially on difficult items. End sub quote. Researchers have also discovered that black students engaging in a challenging task have significantly higher blood pressure when under stereotype threat than when not under stereotype threat, and have higher blood pressure under both conditions than do white students. It is important to recognize that this phenomenon is not occurring because of a person's overall level of self-esteem or some other stable dispositional quality or personality trait. Mathematically inclined white male students are a group thought to enjoy high levels of self-esteem. When they were told that Asians generally scored better than whites on a challenging math test, they performed significantly less well on it than they did when not met with such a stereotype threat. The phenomenon occurs not because of the dispositional qualities or personality traits of the test takers, but rather because of exterior situational influences, aka hidden curricula, 
That is, the threat of being stereotyped. And so it is that stereotypes are often self-fulfilling, end quote. In this same line of research, it has also been shown that when a simple demographic question to identify race was asked before a test was given, it affected the outcomes for black males. That is the hidden curriculum at work. The children's brains interacted with a policy, collect demographic information before the test, to create a pattern of behavior independent of anyone's awareness of how it happened. Stereotype threat is but one example of a more general phenomena that is collectively referred to as the hidden curriculum. The scientific basis of catalytic pedagogy is primarily self-determination theory, SDT. The most central claim of SDT is that humans have primary psychological needs for relatedness, autonomy, and competence. Primary indicates that humans derive well-being directly from the satisfaction of those types of needs. Another central claim is that our minds generate motivation by non-consciously evaluating situations to determine to what degree the activities available are supportive of our needs and consistent with our identities and goals. If we think of motivation as the generation of attentional energy, then the character of that energy will be determined by how well the situation meets the needs of the self. Inputs from the external world are internally assessed in order to decide how much attentional capital to make available for investment in the activities on offer. The mind uses primary needs as the unconscious basis for evaluating how much risk to take as it settles on the type or types of motivation it shall express in that situation. The higher the attentional risk, the higher the educational reward. SDT scientists have consistently observed that motivation occurs on a six-part spectrum. From the least to most functional, the spectrum goes a motivation, external regulation, interjected regulation, identified regulation, integrated regulation, and finally, intrinsic motivation. To better understand the spectrum of motivation, we are going to use motivations for playing soccer as an example. Starting with a motivation, you have to envision the strange situation in which our subject is seated with a soccer ball sitting near one of her feet, which is dangling freely without touching the floor. Then someone else uses a rubber hammer to activate her patellar reflex, which causes her foot and lower leg to involuntarily kick the ball. She will readily acknowledge that her foot did make the soccer ball move, but beyond that, she had nothing to do with it. She takes no responsibility for her participation in this soccer activity. Next is external regulation in which our soccer player is offered rewards or threatened with punishments. There is a myth that rewards and punishments are terrific motivators. It is true that they have some degree of power to induce compliant behaviors. But given the low quality of the motivation that results, it is ridiculous to regard this type of motivation positively, given that far better motivations are available. Next is introjected regulation, in which our soccer player feels guided by anxiety, guilt, pride, or other social emotions. This is where emotional manipulation gets its power. The three types of motivation covered so far are collectively referred to as controlled motivations. Next is identified regulation, in which our soccer player can logically justify her participation in the sport. She is able to generate justifications that help her understand why her participation is a good idea. Next is integrated regulation, in which our soccer player knows that this is what people like her do. It is part of who she is as that kind of person. She just does it without having to come up with justifications for it, nor being overtly guided by emotional responses. Emotions play a part in everything we do, but they are more implicit or in the background at this level of motivation. Finally, in the thrall of intrinsic motivation, our soccer player is simply enthusiastic about it because to her it is inherently enjoyable. The middle four items in the spectrum 
which are each labeled regulation and appear inside the darker gray box in the diagram on page 11, are all forms of extrinsic motivation. Note that the intrinsic-extrinsic motivation dichotomy has been largely abandoned by the SDT community. A new, more helpful dichotomy splits the spectrum down the middle, with the first three less functional forms of motivation grouped together under the term controlled, while the last three more functional forms are grouped under the label autonomous. Controlled motivations are the result of the mind putting less attentional energy at risk, while autonomous motivations indicate putting more at risk. The type of extrinsic motivation that occurs can change over time through processes called internalization and externalization. When primary psychological needs are being satisfied, then internalization occurs, which moves the person up the spectrum towards more autonomous motivations. When primary psychological needs are being thwarted, then externalization occurs, which moves the person down the spectrum toward more controlled motivations. Given the type of motivation that was generated, the non-conscious mind will move on to deciding how best to invest that allocation of attentional energy in terms of engagement. Everyone is familiar with the most trivial form of engagement, behavioral. Few outside of the SDT community seem to be aware of agentic engagement. Agentic engagement is the social process of injecting your opinions, preferences, identities, and other meaningful aspects of yourself into available activities. While I have presented this model as a simple linear progression, going from need satisfaction to motivation to engagement, it is probably non-linear. The three elements of need satisfaction, motivation, and engagement would probably be more accurately thought of as mutually reinforcing. That mutual reinforcement might be portrayed like a recycling symbol that takes situational need support as an input and produces learning as an output, as shown in the graphic on page 12. The graphic presents the psychological energy system in which the environmental supports found in the situation are the primary input. The graphic shows the input arrow on the upper left side pointing down towards the three bent arrows in the familiar recycling pattern, though in this case the triangle is pointing down instead of up. On the upper right side is an arrow pointing up labeled output, learning, and situational inputs. The mind takes the inputs from the situation as a source of fuel, which is also known as primary human needs. The fuel is converted into power by the non-conscious motivational process. That power is applied to the external situation through the engagement process in the form of work, meaning the production of thoughts and behaviors that have the potential to alter the situation and the cognitive structures that embody the learner's understanding of that situation. Once again, while it is convenient to present this in linear form, the truth is that the psychological energy system may be non-linear, with the potential to be both self-reinforcing and self-defeating. Answering Dewey's 1938 call for a theory of experience. An experience is educative when primary needs are satisfied, motivations are autonomous, and engagement is agentic. When needs are fully satisfied, the mind can allocate the most attentional energy possible and takes the highest possible risks by injecting as much of the self into the situation as is possible. In that scenario, the self is maximally open to being changed by the feedback that it receives from the situation. The degree of educational benefits of the situation follow from the degree of openness that the self achieves. An experience is educative when the person having that experience is fully engaged in it. Full engagement, technically agentic engagement, occurs when the environment provides individuals with certain types of support. It is also important to note that academics are not as important to being an educated person as they have been made out to be, which is a major theme in Chapter 7. To summarize, 1. 
Psychological need satisfaction leads to autonomous motivations, which lead to engagement to becoming more agentic. Two, the reason that mainstream schools fail to facilitate deeper learning is that they have developed cultural patterns, also known as a grammar of schooling or a hidden curriculum, that consistently neglect or actively block the satisfaction of the psychological needs of both students and teachers. If you are familiar with some or all of the terms in this chapter but are not familiar with SDT, then consider the possibility that those terms may not mean what you think they mean. Appendix 1 starts off addressing seemingly credible critics who raised what appear to be plausible critiques. Upon closer examination, those critiques lose credibility because the critics were either misinformed about SDT or misunderstood its claims. The roles of need, satisfaction, motivation, and engagement in learning mean that the grammar of schooling that has been unchanged since at least 1890 is toxic. Since the cause of these problems is cultural, we can say that teachers and students are not the real problem with schools, but the system is. An analogy will help to explain how culture puts subtle pressures on us to experience and operate in the world in certain ways, but not necessarily ways that are ultimately beneficial. Let's imagine an airplane full of passengers who are all children with a crew of caring and professional adults. Specifically, a late 1990s era Korean Airlines nonstop transcontinental flight from Seoul, South Korea to Buenos Aires, Argentina, a journey of over 12,000 miles. Now, in this fantasy scenario, there is a law that specifies how the pilots must navigate. Lawmakers took their job of regulating airlines seriously. They knew that the job of the pilot is to get the plane in the air, point it in the right direction, and then bring it down again. So they passed a law that says, as soon as the airplane is in the air, the pilots must set the exact right compass heading that is required for the entire flight. The pilots on our Korean air flight both respect authority and want to avoid punishment for disobeying that law. But instead of arriving in Buenos Aires, our flight ends up in bad weather over the South Atlantic Ocean, running out of fuel. The captain makes an error in executing the emergency procedures. What should we expect to happen? Does everyone live or die? In the late 1990s, Korean Air pilots were 17 times more likely than United Airlines pilots to crash in an emergency. And, for reference, United Airlines was on par with the industry as a whole. As Malcolm Gladwell put it in an interview summarizing a story he told in his best-selling book, Outliers, quote, Korean Air had more plane crashes than almost any other airline in the world for a period at the end of the 1990s. When we think of airline crashes, we think, oh, they must have had old planes. They must have had bad pilots. No. What they were struggling with was a cultural legacy that Korean culture is hierarchical. You are obliged to be deferential towards your elders and superiors in a way that would be unimaginable in the U.S. But Boeing and Airbus design modern, complex airplanes to be flown by two equals. That works beautifully in more egalitarian cultures like the U.S. But in cultures that are more hierarchical like South Korea, it's very difficult. I used a case study of a very famous plane crash in Guam of Korean Air. They're flying along and they run into a little bit of trouble. The weather's bad. The pilot makes an error, and the co-pilot doesn't correct him. End quote. The result, 228 of 254 souls aboard died. When deciding what to expect at the end of my fantasy scenario of children being flown to Buenos Aires, what is important for you to consider is not personal individual characteristics and decisions, but rather differences in behavior that originate in culture. A pattern of differences in human behavior of cultural origin can be a particularly challenging problem to solve because of how brains work with respect to culture. Specifically, individuals cannot consciously control how culture influences their behavior. Therefore, it is not reasonable to hold individuals, pilots, co-pilots, teachers, students, etc., responsible for the effects of their culture. 
Individuals are responsible for the conscious choices they make, but to hold them responsible for how non-conscious influences affect their decision-making processes is problematic. On the other hand, organizations and governments in particular are important sources of cultural influence, and so the outcomes of the cultures they create are their responsibility. Remember the legislated navigation policy mentioned in my fantasy flight scenario. That law is a cultural influence that was too rigid for the situation of transcontinental air travel. A single degree of navigational error at the outset of a 12,000 mile journey would end up putting an airplane over 200 miles away from its intended destination. When we add in the effects of weather, even an accurate heading set at the start of such a long distance flight can become a magnitude of error far greater than 200 miles. The complex and dynamic forces that we commonly refer to as the weather will have cumulative effects on the course of an airplane. Those effects will make what may seem like a teeny tiny error early on into a very large error by the end of the trip. Due to weather, Airplane navigation has never been and can never become a one-and-done process. When legislators seek control of professional behavior, they are second-guessing the whole idea of professionalism. When that law prevented those pilots from using either their own professional navigational skills or from relying on the even more accurate technology of an autopilot system, the makers of that law deprive those professionals of authority to apply the judgments that their professional training prepared them to exercise. No matter how well-meaning those legislators were, they overstepped the bounds of both reasonable industry regulation and reasonable management of an irreducibly complex task. Both Korean Air and the government that regulates their industry are the entities responsible for the cultural influences that affect the minds of their pilots. Let's turn to a real-world example of how government specifications can go awry. In his book, The End of Average, Todd Rose writes, quote, In the late 1940s, the United States Air Force had a serious problem. Its pilots could not keep control of their planes. Although this was the dawn of jet-powered aviation and the planes were faster and more complicated to fly, the problems were so frequent and involved so many different aircraft that the Air Force had an alarming life-or-death mystery on its hands. It was a difficult time to be flying, one retired airman told me. You never knew if you were going to end up in the dirt. At its worst point, 17 pilots crashed in a single day. The two government designations for these non-combat mishaps were incidents and accidents, and they ranged from unintended dives and bungled landings to aircraft obliterating fatalities. At first, the military brass pinned the blame on the men in the cockpits, citing pilot error as the most common reason in crash reports. This judgment certainly seemed reasonable, since the blames themselves seldom malfunctioned. Engineers confirmed this time and again, testing the mechanics and the electronics of the planes and finding no defects. Pilots, too, were baffled. The only thing they knew for sure was that their piloting skills were not the cause of the problem. If it wasn't human or mechanical error, what was it? End quote. To make a long story short, the government specifications for aircraft cockpits were based on taking pilots' measurements. In 1926, they took 10 different measurements and averaged each one. Those 10 dimensions were then used as government-issued manufacturing specifications on the assumption that most people are average. However, when they re-measured 4,063 pilots in 1950 to see if pilots might have changed, they gave that data to Lieutenant Gilbert S. Daniels, a physical anthropologist. Instead of assuming that the majority of the pilots would fall close to all the averages, he decided to count how many pilots were actually average. More specifically, how many would fall within the middle 30% of the range across all 10 dimensions? The answer was zero.
Not a single person met the criteria for being average on 10 dimensions. Knocking it down to just three dimensions still only got him 3.5% of the pilots. The solution was to demand cockpits that could be personalized. The government specifications were changed so that aircraft manufacturers were required to design their aircraft to allow the middle 90% of humans to fit on each dimension. As you might imagine, the companies threw a fit, claiming that meeting these new specifications would be too expensive and take forever. By Rose's account, the changes turned out to be quick, cheap, and easy. My Flight of Fantasy portrays systemic problems based in culture that produced immoral outcomes. I take it that we all agree that killing people unnecessarily is bad. Not merely inconvenient, not merely unfortunate, it is morally reprehensible. Therefore, it is the moral duty of anyone with the power to do so to change a cultural system that is producing bad outcomes. Our moral duty is to change the culture. Culture is the source of those bad outcomes, but no individual is to blame, and there is no conspiracy. In fact, it is counterproductive to posit conspiracies and cast blame because those actions are likely to merely replace one toxic cultural pattern with another or simply add another layer of toxicity into the situation. To be clear about the analogy, teachers are pilots, schools are airlines, and legislators are passing laws that seem good on the surface, but that ultimately cause schools and teachers to inadvertently do harm to children, despite everyone's best intentions. Similar to the effects of weather on airplane navigation, the complex and dynamic forces that we commonly refer to as growing up will have cumulative effects on the life course of a child. When a law prevents teachers from using their own professional judgments or students from using their developing life skills, the makers of that law deprive those professionals of authority to apply their judgments and deprive those students of developmental opportunities. The mainstream culture of schools worldwide is trapped in a pattern of actively thwarting and or passively neglecting the primary psychological needs of students and teachers. The system is the problem, and blaming the students, teachers, or any other individual people for the problem is not helpful. The most stable features of the school system were, according to Cuban, age grading and the grammar of schooling. A central example of harm being systematically done to children by those features is the epidemic of disengagement. You might not be familiar with the epidemic of disengagement because it is not usually given much attention in the media. For example, consider a literacy. You might not be familiar with the term, but it refers to someone who knows how to read but chooses not to. When schooling intended to achieve maximum literacy leads consistently to a significant degree of a literacy, that is a subtle sign of harms being done. Not to mention the illiteracy that also continues to exist. On the other hand, you might be familiar with the cultural trope that most children hate school, which is a fuzzy, unscientific notion that suggests they are systematically disengaged. The epidemic of disengagement has three main large-scale symptoms. Dropouts, who completely disengage from school. Underachievers, who disengage from fully applying themselves to completing the task required for achievement. And faux-achievers, who jump through the hoops to get the rewards without properly learning the lessons taught. Some folks' moral intuitions might dismiss one or more of these symptoms as being merely inconvenient or merely unfortunate, but not truly bad. I understand that intuition because I once felt that way myself, having grown up attending mainstream K-12 public schools. I changed my mind when I encountered the best available science on disengagement, which consistently concluded that the thwarting of primary psychological needs is the most central cause of disengagement. To put that in perspective, you would never accept as normal a school that suffocates, starves, dehydrates, or exposes a child to the elements. 
Any school that did any one of those things would be prosecuted for gross negligence at the very least. We recognize that children should never be deprived in those ways. Both logically and emotionally, we understand those needs as primary causes of children's well-being, which is what our moral sense is attuned to protecting. It is also true that well-being is central to the deeper learning we expect schools to facilitate in students. We hold the satisfaction of those physical needs to be sacrosanct. But what if we discover that there are additional primary psychological causes of well-being, which also happen to cause the deeper learning we expect of schools? It is obvious that we should also treat them with a similar degree of sanctity. If engagement was merely a form of psychological icing on the cake of schooling, then we might be excused for allowing disengagement to run rampant. The current patterns of behavior in mainstream schools are a consequence of ignorance of the scientific facts and their moral implications. Schools currently operate as if engagement is a form of psychological icing on the cake of schooling, but that best available science I mentioned before shows that engagement is not the icing, it is the cake. No reasonable person would expect a child who is suffocating, starving, dehydrating, and or being exposed to the elements to be learning their times tables during those deprivations. A reasonable person recognizes those deprivations as wrong, as morally reprehensible, because those are the physical bases of well-being, which is necessary to learning. The science in this case clearly implies that it is equally unreasonable, and given the well-being consequences, morally wrong to expect children to learn lessons when they are sleep-deprived, socially isolated, externally controlled, and or blocked from becoming competent. The needs for sleep, relatedness, autonomy, and competence are the psychological bases of well-being and the basis of the deeper learning that is required to be successful in our society today. Thwarting and or neglecting those needs in schools should be regarded as morally reprehensible in any culture that values the well-being of children. The combination of scientific facts about well-being and the tendency to be ignorant of the moral implications of those facts means that we need to recalibrate our sense of what counts as normal and acceptable in schools. Since 1999, Korean Airlines has found ways to recalibrate what their pilots count as normal and acceptable communication during emergencies. One way that they have accomplished that feat of cultural adjustment is to require pilots to speak English in the cockpit because the hierarchical social pattern is deeply encoded in the Korean language. Schools also need to accomplish feats of cultural adjustment that will require them to normalize something different from what they usually do now. Later on, I'll be more specific about that. Any school system that normalizes the neglect or thwarting of primary psychological needs is producing deplorable outcomes. They are causing unnecessary harms to children and their teachers. Those outcomes are not merely inconvenient, not merely unfortunate. They are unacceptably bad. Therefore, it is our moral duty to change the culture of that school system according to the moral implications of those scientific facts. This means that the challenge we face as leaders is to shift the mainstream of school culture from being pervasively need negligent into pervasively need satisfying. We need to change the hidden curriculum in order to create support for primary human needs and eliminate the currently normalized neglect and thwarting of primary needs. Following the example of the Air Force cockpit challenge described earlier, you might say that personalization is called for but that term already has some baggage that is counterproductive in this situation. The vast majority of the personalization conversation in schools is about personalizing academic content, which is morally trivial, not about better meeting primary needs, which is morally central. To be clear, personalizing academic content might be instructionally important, but that does not change the fact that which academic content is chosen or how has nothing to do 
with whether or not primary needs have been satisfied, neglected, or thwarted. In the next chapter, we will explore the moral imperative of schooling that follows from the scientific facts that we have been discussing. This concludes the third episode of the Agentic Schools Manifesto. If you would like to gain access to the illustrations, the footnotes, the appendices, and the bibliography, the PDF and illustrated video versions of the book are available as membership benefits when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more at dladvocates.org forward slash donate. If you would like more information about the catalytic pedagogy philosophy, how self-determination theory applies in education, and what it will take to transform education systems around the globe, check out my other website, holisticequity.org. There, under the Tools tab, you will find a variety of valuable ways to either deepen your understanding or apply that understanding in your school. Thank you for your kind attention.